Why should we behave properly? Why should we live godly lives? In this sermon, Pastor David explains that what makes Christian morality, actually Christian, is its motivation. Lord, as we come before your word, we need help. We need help to focus during a sermon. We need help to humbly receive your word. Lord, we need help putting these things into practice. We even need your help trusting your word. So, Lord, we pray that you would work in our midst. Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit of God would work even now. Father, we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Being good and doing what is right doesn't make you a Christian. Our behavior is not what defines us, although it is important. The truth is that anybody can learn to follow rules, to jump through hoops, to learn to behave properly. This morning I want us to consider what is it that makes Christian morality Christian? What is it that makes Christian ethics truly Christian, not merely ethical? It's not necessarily the the commands that we follow, although those are important. It's not the law that God has given. It's actually the motivation, the reason for it. That's what makes Christian morality truly Christian. So think with me. Why do Christians do what they do? Why, Why should we even bother being good? We celebrate the gospel, the gospel, what Christ has done. That's what saves us. Does it matter how we live? Well, yes, it does. So why, why does it matter? Why should we behave properly? What is the reason for our right conduct? Well, we're going to find the answer at the end of Ephesians chapter 4. So take a Bible and look with me. We're going to focus in verse 30, but I'm going to read the whole paragraph that this is contained in. So the reading will begin at verse 25. Hear now the word of the Lord, God's holy, perfect, inerrant, infallible word. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. This is the word of the Lord. I want us to consider verse 30, and specifically how verse 30 fits into its context. Uh, In this section, as we've been considering recently, uh, we are being told what it looks like to put off the old self and put on the new self. What it looks like to repent and to walk in righteousness. Paul has been giving us examples. In the most practical of terms, he's been telling us how to behave In the midst of all this moral instruction, as he lists the do's and don'ts, he brings up the Holy Spirit. Why does he do so? Is this a change of subject? Is this just out of place? Again, he's giving us these commands. He says, then don't grieve the Spirit. And then he goes back into giving us more commands. What's this verse doing here? Well, he's not changed the subject. He's right on track He's already told us, back in verse 27, that we need to be careful not to give the devil an opportunity in our life. So it's not surprising that he also tells us to not grieve the Holy Spirit. 
You see, this is a reminder that all of our actions take place in the midst of spiritual realities. Every moral decision that we make is part of a raging spiritual battle. Paul's going to address it much more thoroughly when we get to chapter 6. But here he reminds us that this is more than just our behavior, our thoughts, our words. This is part of a, a spiritual battle. So why should our conduct be pure and upright? Well, the answer is there in verse 30. Let's look at it again. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Here's the question we need to deal with. Why should we behave properly? What's the, the motivation for it? The ultimate reason for our good conduct, our righteous living, our holiness, is that we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. We are indwelt by the Spirit of God. You see, the Christian ethic flows not from an attempt to earn God's pleasure, earn His goodness towards us. No, no, it flows from that. God has been good to us. The gospel saves us by grace alone, but then it leads us to action. Christian conduct flows out of love. It's because we want to honor God. We want to worship God. We want to bring Him glory. This is the reason for our conduct, our behavior. The fact that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God motivates us to do what is right. We don't want to grieve Him. Rather, we want to bring Him joy and pleasure. We want Him to smile. We don't want to bring him disappointment. What makes Christian behavior truly Christian is that we're trying to glorify God by our behavior. Now this text specifically focuses in on the Holy Spirit. So let's, let's do that together this morning. Who is the Holy Spirit? Let's just start there. Let's make sure we define our terms carefully. The Holy Spirit is God. There is one true God, and the true God he exists in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This is the Trinity. We read from the Athanasian Creed. Let me remind you of a few lines from that historic confession. We worship one God in Trinity and the Trinity in unity, neither confounding their persons nor dividing their essence. Later it says, thus the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. There are not three gods, but there is one God. None in this trinity is before or after, none is greater or smaller. In their entirety, the three persons are co-eternal and co-equal with one another. So our brothers and sisters, so many hundreds of years ago, they gave us a faithful summary of what the Bible teaches about God. The Trinity is hard for us to comprehend. It's beyond us. And yet, we have to be faithful to what the Scripture has taught us. The Holy Spirit is not the Son, nor is the Son the Father. There is a distinction. There are different persons. And yet, Father, Son, and Spirit are God that bends the mind. And yet, it's what the Scripture teaches us. So we must worship God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. What I want us to do this morning is to zoom in on the Spirit. The Spirit sometimes neglected. We focus on Jesus. He's the Savior of the world, and rightfully so. In fact, the Scripture tells us that the Spirit is drawing attention to. It's as if the Spirit is putting a spotlight on Christ. And yet the Scripture does speak of the Spirit and what He, what he does in our lives. We could spend weeks walking through different aspects of what the Spirit does. I want us to note something very important about the Spirit. The Spirit is not a, an it. It's not a thing. He is a person. The Spirit in Scripture is said to fill Christians. 
Christians can be in the Spirit. They can be filled with the Spirit. They're said to be living by the Spirit, to walk with the Spirit, to keep in step with the Spirit, to worship by the Spirit. We are said to have truth revealed to us through the Spirit. And yet the Spirit is a person. I think sometimes people think of the Holy Spirit much more like the force from Star Wars, right? We start thinking about this influence, this, this just something out there. But no, the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not a, a force that we plug into to receive spiritual power. No, he is by all means associated with power. So Acts 1.8 says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So, so the Spirit comes with power, or 2 Timothy 1, 7. God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So the spirit is powerful. And he is a source of power, but he's not a force like electricity. He's not merely an influence. The scripture says that he speaks, he loves, he chooses, he teaches, he leads, he guides, and he can be grieved. Again and again, the scripture refers to the Holy Spirit in personal terms. So even look at our text. Look at verse 30 again. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom, not by which, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The Spirit is a person. And perhaps most importantly, He is the person of God that dwells within His people. This is an incredible privilege. But we have been given the Holy Spirit of God. Romans chapter 8 is really about life in the Spirit. I want to read you just a few verses. Beginning at verse 8, Paul writes this, For those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ, does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. This is the characteristic of the Spirit that is brought up the most often in Scripture. The fact that He dwells in His people. This is a glorious privilege. The Bible is clear that we are not divine. And yet, the divine one, God, has come to dwell in us. What an incredible privilege. Well, with all that in view... Look at verse 30 yet again. Here's the responsibility, the duty we've been given. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. How can we grieve the Holy Spirit? If we're warned not to do it, we better think this through. What is it that grieves the Holy Spirit? Well, as I wrestled with this this week, I found... An interesting cross-reference. There's only one other place in the Bible where we read about the grieving of the Holy Spirit. It's in the prophet Isaiah. And what Isaiah is doing in this section, he's describing how the people of God, the people of Israel, whom God rescued out of Egypt, they rebelled against God in the wilderness. So that's the context. Here's what Isaiah says in Isaiah 63, verse 10. He says, But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore he turned to be their enemy, and he himself fought against them. So the people of Israel, they refused to do what God had said. They did not obey the Lord, and they refused to trust him. They doubted that God could do what he had promised. And so the Lord indeed did turn against them in the sense that he brought discipline upon his people. And they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because of their rebellion, because of their rejection, both of what God had said and trusting him and actually doing what he had commanded. 
This wasn't a, a final end to the people of God. But this grieving of the Holy Spirit led to discipline. It led to serious consequences. Well, brothers and sisters, we can grieve the Spirit when we do the same thing, when we break God's law, and when we doubt what He has said. It really comes down to this. We are supposed to trust and obey. But when we fail to do that, when we distrust and disobey, we grieve the Holy Spirit. Of course, more can be said about this. He is, after all, the Holy Spirit. So anything that is unholy grieves the Spirit. Likewise, he's called the Spirit of truth. So when his people lie, it grieves the Spirit. Earlier in Ephesians 4, we are called to maintain, to preserve the unity of the Spirit. That means disunity and division grieves the Spirit of God. In fact, every sin, but especially the ones mentioned in this text, grieve the Holy Spirit. You see, that's what Paul is doing. That's why this isn't a change of subject. He's giving us the motivation for why we should walk in such a manner. All of these commands come back to, of course we should do that because we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit of God who dwells in his people. There is an intimacy that we have with the Spirit. Father, he's the creator of all. We have Jesus who came and died for us but is now ruling and reigning from heaven and yet the Spirit has come to dwell in in us. Jesus said he would send another helper, a a comforter, an advocate like him to be in us. In fact, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ. The very means by which Christ is with his people is mediated through the Holy Spirit. That's how God is with us, through the Spirit. And so if God is, is so close to us, we don't want to grieve the Spirit. But that's exactly what we do. When we sin. Now, the scripture makes it clear that when we sin, we are sinning right there with God. Not that God is doing the sinning, but he's, he's right there in the midst of it. Of course it grieves him. Now, this is the logic of 1 Corinthians 6. At the end of the chapter, we're told this. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 18 says, Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of the body. But sexually immoral persons sin against his own body. Or do you not know that the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Notice the logic. The reason that we need to refrain from sexual morality of all kinds is that God is with us. This is the motivation for all that we ought to do in the Christian life. We have God dwelling right with us, and we do not want to bring him grief. We want to bring him delight. We don't want to bring him displeasure or pain. We want to bring him joy. The work of the Holy Spirit is to sanctify us, to make us holy, to mature the people of God. It's the Spirit that enables us to put sin to death and to live in righteousness. So when we sin, we're not only resisting the Spirit, we're actually grieving the Spirit. So we need to ask ourselves before we take action, is what I'm considering, what I'm about to do or to say, is it going to please the Holy Spirit? Or is it going to grieve the Holy Spirit. It's not merely our actions and the words that we speak. It's even our thoughts that can grieve the Spirit. Sin is anything we think, say, or do that is contrary to the Word of God. And we need to to slow down and think, okay, am I about to do something that is honoring to the Lord? That's what Scripture calls us to, to do everything unto the glory of God, to bring honor and praise to Him. That would be the opposite of grieving the Spirit. Perhaps most fundamentally, we grieve the Spirit 
by acting like he's not here. We simply ignore him. I mean, is there anything more offensive than to have someone just walk right by and act like you're not there? They, they just don't say hi. They just don't acknowledge your existence. And yet, at times, that's exactly what Christians do. We just act as if we're just doing our thing, as if we are independent. But we're not. We are a dependent people. We have been given the Spirit of God. He's with us. And so we should live in His presence. There's just some things that you're not going to do in your own house when you have a distinguished guest over. You might do it if it were just you, but no, company is over, and so you're not going to behave in that way. We are on our best behavior when we're in the presence of an honored person. And the Scripture tells us the Holy Spirit of God is in our presence all the time. You see how this is the motivation for right action. The Christian sanctification flows from the understanding that God is with us. Our every action can bring Him delight or disappointment. Our every word can give Him glory or grief. Finally, we've got to deal with the second half of the verse. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. What does this sealing for the day mean? of redemption mean? What is he referring to? What is this sealing? Well, it's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit by which God has marked us as his own. We see it earlier in Ephesians, so flip back to chapter 1. Verses 13 and 14, we read this. In him you also, when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. So here we're told that we believe, we trust in the Lord, and what we receive in that moment at our justification is we receive the Spirit. The Spirit is this this mark, this seal that we are His. This is gloriously encouraging. The Spirit being in us is part of our assurance of our salvation. God has marked us as His. We have the Spirit. It's the guarantee that indeed we're going to make it to the end. God's Spirit will see to it. Sometimes we sing together that hymn, He will hold me fast. The Lord is holding us. Well, the Lord is actually in us. God is in us to see to it that we make it to the end. This is glorious good news. I remember when I was young, I was interacting with another high school student. And he said, wait, you mean you believe in that once saved, always saved? And then he used a a, a rough word. And, And I... Well, I wouldn't call it that, but yes, I believe that once you're saved, you're saved. You, you, you really are saved. You're going to stay saved. And he was all upset. He's like, well, then what motivates you towards holiness? If you think you're saved, then you, you can just go on sinning. It doesn't matter how you live. Well, that's not the truth of Scripture. The assurance that the Bible teaches is an assurance that sanctifies. See, we have the Spirit, and what is the Spirit doing in us? He's making us holy. He's preparing us for our heavenly home. So yes, we have been marked. We have been sealed with a spirit. And that spirit is at work in us. We can cooperate with him in the sanctification process. Or we can grieve him. Now thankfully, he will not let us go. He's going to come after us even when we sin. The Lord's discipline is heavy upon his children. But we must seek not to grieve him, but rather to cooperate with him, to walk in his ways. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, we read this. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, beloved brothers, by the Lord, because God chose you as the firstfruits to be saved. So God has made a choice. We are going to be saved. Sounds good. God chose you as firstfruits to be saved through the sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So we are saved through sanctification. Now we've got to think this through. We've got big theological terms. Justification, 
is being declared righteous. This is the beginning of the Christian life. We put our faith in Christ. We are declared righteous. We are justified. That begins a lifelong process of sanctification, which is ultimately concluded with glorification. That's when we're perfect. That happens when we're in heaven with God. But notice it all fits together. God planned for us to be saved through sanctification. This is what the Spirit is doing in us. And it is good news. You see, at the root of Christian morality is the gospel. We know we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. And yet, we are saved unto good works. So come back to Ephesians chapter 2. You know these verses, but I'll read them yet again. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. So abundantly clear. The only way we could ever be reconciled to God is God's grace. It's what he has done for us, not what we do. We are not saved by our works. We're saved by grace. And that grace there is referring to what Jesus did for us. He lived a perfect life. He died the death that we deserve. He dies so that our sins could be forgiven and so that our sins could be forsaken. You see, part of salvation is transforming the people of God into those who actually love doing what is good and right. I said we're not saved by works, but we are saved unto good works because that's exactly what Paul says next. So let me go back to verse 8 and I'll read all the way through 10 this time. For by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Brothers and sisters, this is so foundational to the Christian life. We're saved by grace, not by works, but we are saved unto good works. So do we need to pursue holiness? By all means. This is what the Spirit is doing in us. We don't want to grieve the Spirit. We want to be empowered by Him to walk in His ways. Our text tells us that we have been sealed. The Spirit is this guarantee of our final salvation. This is the mark that one day we shall be finally perfected, completely redeemed. Verse 30 again. That phrase at the end of the verse, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. What's the day of redemption? It's when Christ comes back. It's when salvation is finished and complete. It's when we are all with the Lord. When we are glorified and Done with this earthly life. Time for a new heavens, a new earth. With that in view, Paul calls us to persevere in our sanctification. Because our glorification is coming. The Spirit, He has sealed us for that day. So why would we grieve Him? He's working in us to make us holy. So we should join Him in that effort. The end of our sanctification is our perfection. And that is what should motivate us to press on. In fact, you see this at the very beginning of Ephesians. Paul can't get it off his mind. So in chapter 1, verse 4, he says, He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. This was the plan. God saving us so that we would one day really be holy and blameless. And what is the Spirit doing in us now? Well, he's making us more and more holy. The motivation for Christian morality is what God has done and what he is doing for us. It's the gospel. It's the grace of God. And that includes what the Spirit is doing in making us a holy people. We know where we're heading. We know our final destination. And we know the Spirit is in us to enable us, to help us to get there. The book of Hebrews says there is a holiness without which no one will see the Lord. You don't get into heaven without being holy. That's what the Spirit is doing. He's making sure that His people are made holy for the day of redemption. Brothers and sisters, what a privilege it is to have God 
dwell in us. He's working to perfect us, to make us as we ought to be. So as Paul writes here, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We need to remember the Holy Spirit. We need to remember what the Spirit is doing. We need to think of the day that is coming when the Spirit's work will actually be done in us and we will be perfected. With all of that in view, the things that grieve the Spirit, they should become absolutely unthinkable. They should grieve us as well. Let's pray together. Lord, we're so thankful for a free salvation. We're thankful for the gift of your grace. We're thankful that we don't have to try to earn our way into heaven, but rather it's a gift freely received. And part of that gift is that we don't have to keep living a life of sin. You, by your Spirit, enable us to really put sin to death and to live in holiness and righteousness. So Lord, we come and we pray that you would help each one of us to trust in you with all of our heart. And to help us not grieve the Holy Spirit. Lord, keep us from sin. When temptations come, let us be mindful of the Spirit that is working in us to bring us all the way home. The Spirit's the guarantee that we will make it to glory. Lord, help us to joyfully cooperate with Him, to work with the Spirit towards holiness. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. What makes our behavior Christian is that it comes from a desire to glorify God. Through His Spirit, we now see that life works better His way. It glorifies Him, and it is good for the fabric of society. Tomorrow, we end this series with Forgive One Another, Ephesians 4 31-32.